plastic pollution is one of the greatest scourges of the modern era. Enormous garbage patches floating in the world's oceans. Basically we've trashed the whole planet. There's plastic in the Arctic, in Antarctica, it's on the sea surface, it's in the bottom of the deepest trenches, it's everywhere. Millions of tons a year tossed away, which will never degrade, just break down into smaller and smaller particles, almost impossible to remove. Microplastic is really difficult to treat, right? When it goes into an environment, there's almost no, no effective way. And for many of us, a feeling of helplessness, unsure of how to stop the problem and unaware of how it affects us. Sixty percent of the world's ocean-borne plastic pollution is coming out of just five countries. China, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia and the Philippines. On this week's program, we're going to look at why so much plastic is coming out of this part of the world, what impact it's having on marine life, and the problem of pollution that is so small you can't even see it, let alone clean it up. Thailand is one of the countries most at risk and at fault. The resort island Phuket, but it now looks more like a paradise lost. Plastic bags, bottles and polystyrene boxes. But some aren't prepared to stand by and watch. These divers are volunteers who come together when they can to try and clean up the ocean floor. Some are professionals, others just dive for fun. But they've all seen the impact of pollution on the underwater world they love so much. From the air, it's hard to see the problem. A long sandy beach that stretches out into crystal blue water. But just 20 meters beneath, the ocean floor is murky and gray. Pollutants and rising temperatures have killed and bleached the corals that thrived in these waters only 20 years ago. For the divers, it's slow and time-consuming work. Plastic nets and fishing lines are tightly entangled in the rocks and stones. Every little bit has to be cut and prized out. Something they can't afford to spend too long doing as their tanks start to run low. Eventually they're forced back to the surface with their catch. The rubbish is weighed and catalogued, then taken for proper disposal. But facing the massive amount of waste, this is just a drop in the ocean. At a local rehabilitation center, you can see the impact on some of the area's most endangered residents. Turtles are some of the largest sea creatures in these waters, loved by tourists, but in recent years, much harder to find in their natural habitat. Their size makes them particularly vulnerable to large bits of plastic waste. or cut their flippers, cuts that become infected or cripple the graceful swimmers. A few lucky ones are delivered by fishermen to this center. Most are washed up dead on the beach. And what about the damage that can't be seen? Threats that are less visible but just as potentially lethal. Brightly colored plastics look just like food in the water snapped up by turtles and other marine life, and then enter the food chain. At some point, all the marine life eat that, including fish and shrimp, and then the fishing, the fishing boat catch that thing for us. And at the end, you know, we consume those plastic too. All toxic contamination will come back to us. That's a huge problem for larger sea creatures. 
This pilot whale was found floundering in the Gulf of Thailand. Despite desperate attempts to keep it alive, it finally succumbed to death after throwing up plastic for days. An autopsy revealed more than eight kilograms of plastic bags in its stomach. A few thousand kilometers away, another individual has launched a personal crusade to try and clean up our seas off the coast of southern China. I guess it started when I moved to Hong Kong about 12 years ago and I'd stopped working and uh, I, had, uh, I went to the beach, I had a very small child, had a lot of free time on my hands and was uh, shocked actually at the rubbish that was on the beach. I'd never seen it um, before. Tracy organized a beach cleanup, then another, and then another. Fast food containers, um, you know, it's excessive packaging a lot of the time, and just, you know, there's other alternatives. These, uh, these companies don't use styrofoam all around the world. Um, in the US, they've, uh, they're banning styrofoam. Australia, they don't use styrofoam anymore at McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, so why do we still have that product here? Tracy does what she can. She started an NGO called Plastic Free Seas. Its goal, to bring plastic free beaches to Hong Kong. But it's a never ending task. Hong Kong's busy waterways mean that every tide generates a tsunami of plastic waste. In her campaign headquarters, Tracy shows me Rosie, a fairground horse washed up on the beach, now a symbol of her campaign. You know, it's just very representative of the things that are ending up in our oceans. You know, it's a dumping ground for, for everything. Tracy wanted to know more. There's been a lot of talk about floating garbage patches deep in the oceans. But who's actually seen them? So she set off on an expedition, 28 days sailing, right to the heart of the Pacific Ocean, well beyond the shipping lanes or any signs of human life. It was not what I expected at all. I mean, the middle of the ocean is actually stunning. It's uh, the color of the water is beautiful. There's albatross flying. Um, it's really an amazing remote place. And we would see odd pieces floating past uh, every other minute or so. But it was when we brought in the trawls, that was when we really knew that we were in the middle of the garbage patch because they were just so full of microplastic particles. There was thousands of pieces. The garbage patch wasn't a visible problem. But in these most remote areas of the planet, thousands of kilometers from land, humanity's waste was everywhere. Big floating landfills like you have in your mind when people say it's a, a garbage patch out there but it was more like a soup, a plastic soup of um, tiny broken down pieces of plastic and in the middle of the garbage patch it was a lot more concentrated. Back home in Hong Kong, Tracy started thinking about what she'd learned. Hong Kong is one of the world's busiest ports and sits below the Chinese mainland, one of the world's largest manufacturing bases. But would that account for so much pollution? Why does the West consume so much plastic, yet Asia get blamed for the problem? The answer was in the containers. You know, the US sends their recycling to Asia, so they're sending a phenomenal amount of plastics that they're not willing to deal with over there um, for countries to deal with here. Um, whether or not the infrastructure is in place to deal with all of this plastic, not all of it can be recycled. So what happens when we've got countries all around the world sending it here and then blaming, blaming Asia for the problems? And once inside Asia, the trail becomes even more complicated. A lot gets shipped to China if they can't process there. They can ship it onto the Philippines or somewhere else down the line. So it's really a very non-transparent um, industry of, of where our trash ends up. Containers full of plastic waste, carefully sorted for recycling by individuals trying to dispose of their rubbish in a responsible manner. Then shipped to countries that neither have the resources nor the skills to deal with it. We would see this for ourselves when we visited an abandoned warehouse close to the Gulf of Thailand. Since China banned the import of plastic waste, much has been redirected to Southeast Asia. Mountains of consumer plastic, bundled for recycling, but abandoned. Asia has become the dumping ground 
for the world's guilty problem. After the break, Tracy starts to delve under the surface to find out how serious the problem is in the waters around Hong Kong. We look at the microplastics we're flushing into the seas that can't be cleaned. And we meet the scientist who's trying to find out how much plastic has already entered into the food chain and what that might be doing to us. The sleepy harbour on Lama Island is what Hong Kong used to look like. Fishing boats bob on the quay as the fishermen unload all manner of exotic shellfish. No one values seafood more than the Cantonese, and this hall is destined for the finest restaurants. The little blue trawler used to be one of those fishing boats, but now it trawls for a different catch. It steams off away from the busy shipping lanes under the flag of a new master. On the deck, the crew prepares the net. But this is designed for a catch that won't end up on someone's dinner plate. At least they hope not. We're looking for microplastics. We want to show how broken down pieces of plastic can get into the food chain. The fine mesh mat is thrown overboard. Oh, ah and left to drag behind the boat. These are breeding grounds, and what's in the sea is eaten by the fish. After a while, the crew haul in the net. The catch is held in a little pod, which is released and emptied, ready for inspection. Then Tracy and her team get to work. What are you seeing here, Tracy, uh, that should be there and what shouldn't be there? So, obviously the fish um, should be there. All the, the brown mass at the bottom is plankton, and I think there's some shrimp larvae in there as well. Uh, sometimes we find jellyfish, I'm not sure if there's any in there, but I can see pieces of plastic um, film wrapping, possibly from food packaging, and uh, some styrofoam. And there's usually a lot of very small fragments that are actually really difficult to see um, with the naked eye. With the help of a small microscope, they can see what the naked eye cannot. Lots of tiny fragments of plastic, broken down from their original size, all of which are very attractive to fish. And amongst them, a few tiny coloured plastic balls, microbeads. It is uh, known that microplastics, um, microbeads are being ingested um, by a lot of filter feeding um, marine life like mussels and clams and things like that. Uh, we find when we do our sea surface trawls on our boat, uh, we can see microbeads in the water, um, tiny red balls or blue balls, um, you know, very obvious that they're designed plastics. It's not coming from fragments. They're supposed to be round balls of plastic. So we know that they are getting into the, into the sea. We know that uh, they're just the right size for some of the fish that we catch as well. As if degraded plastic wasn't bad enough, technology has now added an even bigger problem. Many consumers are now wary of plastic packaging and containers and try to use alternatives. But there is increasing concern about microbeads, tiny little bits of plastic that's being used in cosmetic products to provide an abrasive quality, things like face scrubs or certain types of toothpaste. And we're going to go and see what we can find on the shelves of an ordinary chemist. We've got a phone app here called Beat the Microbead, and by scanning the product barcode, we should be able to tell whether they contain microbeads or not. On the shop shelves, thousands of different products. Although some countries have banned microbeads, their use is still widespread. None of them advertise that they contain microbeads, but it was easy to find some that do. So we've definitely got something here. At this time, the product still contains microplastics. Well, it wasn't hard to find products containing microbeads. They are in many of the pharmacists here, and we found one of the worst offenders, this popular face scrub, which in a 130-gram tube 
is estimated to contain more than 1.4 million microbeads, which will not be stopped by the sewage system. When you wash them off your face, they go straight down the drain and out into the open seas. Billions of tiny little plastic balls, too light to sink, bobbing about close to the surface, brilliantly colored to catch the eye, the perfect fish food. On another spotless beach in Hong Kong, those tiny particles of plastic are a big concern for Dr. Lincoln Fock. This is an area specially cleaned and maintained for public use. But Dr. Fock's research has shown that even here, where the plastics seem to have been cleaned up, the problem is huge. Using some fairly simple tools, a fine sieve, trowel and several buckets, he gets to work. After washing off the sand, what's left behind looks like natural waste. But Dr. Falk knows when he gets back to the lab, much of this will be microplastics. Once this is on the beach, can you ever clean it off? Microplastics is very difficult to clean. It's all part of a much wider study he's undertaken in Hong Kong and southern China. His research shows that these beaches have between five and six thousand pieces of microplastics per square meter. That means on this beach alone, there are more than a billion pieces of plastic. South China, on average, 6,000. In Hong Kong, 5,000 something. Um, South Korea, um, if I, I have not remembered the exact number, is a little bit less, maybe um, 4,000. In the U.S., it's 2,000 something. So it's relatively high. Relatively high might be something of an understatement, but plastic pollution three times as much as the United States. And unlike the bottles, boxes and bags that can be physically removed, these pollutants are here forever. Microplastics is really difficult to treat, right? When it goes into an environment, there's almost no, no effective way. We have very um, expensive ways to treat it, like uh, building a machine in the sea to capture everything that flows on the water, right? But that first, um, the machine is expensive, right? It's costly to run. And in addition, they can't distinguish from floating organism and plastic, right? They can't. They just stuck in everything and collect it. In an accidental breakthrough, scientists recently discovered an enzyme that actually eats plastic. Under the microscope, a plastic bottle is reduced to its basic elements. But as Dr. Falk notes, this works under very specific lab conditions with specialized equipment. The cure-all panacea to plastic pollution is still a long way off. Later that night, we meet Dr. Falk at a popular seafood market. This is precisely the sort of place beloved of locals and visitors to Hong Kong, the freshest and most exotic seafood. Dr. Falk is more wary, however. A recent study undertaken in Europe produced disturbing results. If you like shellfish, on average, you may consume as much as uh, 11,000 pieces of microplastic per year. Microplastic can go into human body directly sometimes, uh, depending on your diet. Imagine so, uh, eating 11,000 pieces of plastic have, uh, a year. Would you be surprised to find microplastics in these? These animals may sometimes may mistaken uh, plastic bags, something like that, as food as well. So. No surprise if you find microplastic in these animals. Right. If we eat these fish or shellfish and we consume the microplastics that are in their intestinal tracts, do we have any idea what it does to us? Uh, so far, the research still remains on marine organisms. For the health effects, is the research, the scientific research is still in the infancy. So. Um, but however, other evidence, just like uh, what I told you about the chemicals going through microplastics into the organism, may finally reach human through the food chain. Few seem to be deterred. 
These are highly prized foods, shipped from all over Southeast Asia, that command premium prices. Amazingly, very few studies have been done into the impact on humans of ingestion of plastic through the food chain. But it's clear that these animals that live in an environment surrounded by plastic pollution are eating it. And by extension, so are we. At his laboratory, Dr. Falk is running a number of different experiments on the microplastics he's found. First, he takes the samples he dug up on the beach. What he finds on close examination is material that will be with us well beyond our natural lives. So um, plastic remains to be plastic for a very long time. It's unlike many organic materials. Uh, what, we, what I mean by long time is that uh, comparing with the human lifespan, right? so it can last for hundreds of years. Some say that it can even last for a thousand years. But under his microscope, he sees something else. Bits of plastic that have discolored, absorbed oil, or other waste products from the sea. So when we have a polluted microplastics, right, they absorb pollutants from the environment, and then the organism are known to eat it, the pollutants would get transferred to the food chain from the physical environment. And that leads him onto his other research project. With his lab assistant, he unbags a flathead mullet, purchased locally, caught in Hong Kong waters. The mullet is dissected, with its digestive tract removed for analysis. His research has found that 60% of these fish contain microplastics, plastics that can't be seen or removed. And while the plastic is inert, the dyes, flame retardants, and other chemicals it contains are not. We know that some chemicals are hazardous, right? They, they, are, they are toxic, right? Uh, some uh, endocrine disruptor as well, right? The chemical impact, indirect impact from microplastic is known. Endocrine disruptors are chemical compositions that mimic human hormones and can disrupt the natural composition of our bodies. And while no one really knows what the impact of microplastics are on the human body, endocrine disruptors are known to be extremely harmful. On human beings, directly related to microplastics, no. But related to endocrine disruptor, we got a lot of study proving that um, those, some of which are, uh, will cause cancer, uh, liver disease, some of which can be dangerous. But we got a lot of them, so um, it actually can cause a series of um, harm to the human body, depending on the species of, of the uh, endocrine disruptor. Seas full of invisible plastic particles entering the food chain that can do untold harm to the human body. But Dr. Falk is also realistic. He knows that plastic is too cheap and too useful to replace. Of course, they are not uh, willing to do that. So, there's a dilemma, as I've said. It's so useful, that's why we use a lot of it. And ultimately, despite all the evidence he and his colleagues have accumulated, all of the campaigns to stop using plastic bags, bottles and straws, it's probably already too late to turn back the tide. It would get worse, but uh, how much worse, uh, I, I cannot say it will definitely get worse because uh, there's no way to um, control um, this type of pollution effectively. Hong Kong is an excellent example of how mankind can thrive in unexpected circumstances. A huge high-rise metropolis perched atop an unlikely island. But it also illustrates how man can temper, control and command his environment often with scant regard for the laws of nature. But in our plastic-filled oceans, we've done the same. More countries are now discussing the banning of products that contain microbeads and trying to find alternatives to plastic packaging with products that break down when they get into the sea. But dealing with the enormous amount of waste already in the world's oceans is a daunting task. And we still don't really know what it's doing to the environment 
to marine life, or even to human beings. But that's all the time we have for this week. If you'd like to find out more about the show, please go to our website, www.assignment-asia.com. I'm Tony Chang. Thanks for watching. This is Assignment Asia. And if you'd like to find out more or contribute ideas for future shows, then please get in touch on social media.